We've had a number of people speak out recently on the events going on in this world. A couple of weeks ago, our president delivered the State of the Union address and made a plea, a call for innovation and creativity. He said, now is the Sputnik moment for the United States to really take charge and to be innovative. Bill Gates recently in an NPR interview said, I am probably the world's best optimist. I believe with creativity and innovation, we can solve the world's biggest problems. Whether it's medicine, education, or technology, we need people thinking about it. Warren Buffett has recently made a plea to the world's billionaires. Invest your resources in helping us solve the big issues of the day. There's a common theme among all of these pleas. Creativity, innovation, forward thinking, integrity, and most of all, the care and the desire to make a difference. I'm so pleased tonight to have a CEO in a company that has put at the center of its mission for its organization making a difference. Stephen Chipman is the CEO of Grant Thornton and has worked with the company for 29 years in Europe, Asia, and the United States. They have put as part of their culture and as part of their strategy to make a difference. It's an imperative. They feel that they can actually achieve their growth and win by making a difference and helping their employees understand how their work impacts not only the corporation, but the communities in which they work. Please join me in welcoming a CEO who makes a difference, Stephen Chipman. Well, thank you, Dean, very much for those very kind and, and gracious remarks. And thank you all very much for joining me here this evening and for giving me such a warm welcome. Uh, although the last time I spoke to such an esteemed audience and was introduced actually as somebody with a warm personality, I certainly felt very complimented about that. I went home actually that evening and I looked up warm in the dictionary and it actually said not so hot. So hopefully uh, I can uh, uh, counter that this evening with my remarks. Uh, I am delighted to be back in Denver. Uh, both my wife and I are very enthusiastic skiers, and I have to say that last week's snow hurricane in Chicago uh, was certainly not the type of snow that I like to be associated with, and much prefer the way that you do your snow here in Colorado and the, the Rocky Mountains, though I may regret saying that by tomorrow morning, I understand. So. <laughs> Um, I hope you all enjoyed uh, the Super Bowl festivities last night. I, um, for those of you who are wondering, I think the football was what was occurring between the advertisements. Um, certainly in Chicago, they're still uh, mourning the loss to the Packers. I, I, as a new resident of Chicago, found it hard to believe that actually that was the first time since Pearl Harbor that the Packers and the Bears had played in the playoffs, and you can only imagine the attention that that got in Chicago, although there are a number of my colleagues there that are quite willing to ship Jay Cutler back to Denver. <laughs> so I don't know how interested you are in that. Um, in, in preparing for this evening, I did go back and take a look at some of your previous speakers' remarks, and in particular, I was, I was taken by uh, Peter Swinburne, CEO of Molson Coors. I, I noticed that he began his remarks by teasing you with the possibility of free samples. Uh, and that really got your attention. Unfortunately, as the CEO of an accounting firm, I'm not sure I have anything quite as interesting that I can tempt you with this evening. But I did find uh, Peter's remarks very interesting. And, and I want to make the point as I start that although our messages are similar, our businesses are obviously very different. Uh, Kurs obviously sell products. We deliver services. Kurs have manufacturing plants and, and use agricultural products uh, and, and obviously have factories. Uh, and we at Grant Thornton have to deal with professional and other regulators and overseers and all the 
risks and issues associated with delivering quality and accurate professional work. However, the, the difference between our businesses does underscore actually a shared point that I think Peter and I both have. And that's namely that regardless of the type of business, executives can create strategies and cultures that are simultaneously ethical and effective, which, as you point out in your fascinating collection of essays, is the essence of good business. As I understand it, this commonality is exactly the philosophy behind your Voices of Experience series. You want to learn more about what experienced real-world business leaders in different sectors and different industries are doing about executing on corporate social responsibility. So before I get into the bulk of my remarks, I, I do want to point out that at Grant Thornton, we are very much at the early stages of our journey in the execution of a corporate social responsibility agenda. But I must also say that, that being a responsible business enterprise has always been part of our culture. We strongly believe that the accounting profession and accounting firms exist to serve the public interest. That's a starting point for us. And we do have strong and absolute confidence in our business philosophy and strategy for success. Our business strategy is not about being the biggest. It's about being the best at what we choose to do. In this way, and very importantly, we aim not only to be the best accounting firm in the world, but the best firm for the world. And that, obviously, is a very ambitious goal. But in these aspirations, there is an intentional and critical link between our business and giving back. But what gives this momentum for us is that here in the United States and throughout our global organization of 30,000 people around the world in 100 countries, we have a shared commitment to that objective. We are, in fact, united, as Dean Reardon mentioned, to a commitment to make a difference, to make a difference to our people, to our clients, to the profession, and most importantly, to our communities. The commitment to make a difference is at the heart of our global strategy, not just here in the United States, but globally around the world. And combined with our global values that are also globally adopted and globally executed across the Grant Thornton platform around the world, this effectively defines who we are, what we stand for at Grant Thornton. And we've certainly seen Many companies, like perhaps uh, Whole Foods or REI, that have done significant business on the back of a strong focus on corporate social responsibility. Developing substantive CSR programs that build brand and strategically boost the bottom line is a long journey. We accept that. We understand that. And as I mentioned, we very much believe that we are at the beginning of that journey. And we know that it's going to require vision. It's going to require tenacity, patience. But most of all, most of all, sincerity of intent. Intention is everything we believe. And realizing intention takes time. And an example of the patience that's needed, actually, I thought uh, when I read it, was in a recent Wall Street Journal article talking about Pepsi's uh, program around corporate social responsibility. Uh, actually, this article was published on January the 31st. Pepsi, you may know, have what's called the Refresh Project, and that invites the public to compete for grant dollars, regardless of whether you're a Pepsi customer. And, and clearly, that is absolutely, without question, enhanced Pepsi, Pepsi's brand but there's a question mark, or at least there was a question mark in this article about what it's done for Pepsi's bottom line. Now, Pepsi's CEO, 
uh, Indra Nui, remains very staunchly and very committed to their CSR initiatives. She sees it as a model for how corporations should differentiate their brands. And I'd like to quote her. She says, it's a matter of what does this company stand for in terms of doing something positive in the world? And I'm going to come back to Ms. Nui a little later in my remarks. So the first part of my comments here this evening are really about this notion that I believe firmly that sincere corporate social responsibility and making profits are inherently interdependent, arguably perhaps the opposite of conventional wisdom. The difference between success and window dressing in this regard lies in the integration of corporate social responsibility goals and objectives with your business's strategic plan. And I believe, going back to Peter Swinburne, this was very much at the heart of some of his remarks. So at Grant Thornton, as Dean Reardon mentioned, we made the commitment to embody our desire to make a difference to our colleagues, our clients, the profession and our communities into the heart of our strategy. Uh, and if you don't mind, perhaps you could share our strategy slide with the audience at this point, please. And I'll give you just a moment to digest this. But as you can see, at the very top of this slide is our mission to make a difference, to make a difference to our colleagues, clients, profession, and our communities. And at the very bottom of the slide are our global values of collaboration, leadership, excellence, agility, respect, and responsibility. So we have put at the heart of our strategy, at the foundation of our strategy, our global values. And at the highest calling of our strategy, if you like, our mission to make a difference. Now, we also have a very clear and we think a very compelling business vision, which is to be the leading accounting firm serving dynamic organizations in our chosen markets. That's that piece about wanting to be the best firm where we choose to be active in the marketplace. And we choose to be active with dynamic organizations, organizations that are growing, expanding, uh, perhaps going into international activities, raising capital, restructuring their businesses. And we have five strategic drivers across revenue growth, talent, operational excellence, brand, and distinctive client service. And I'm going to leave this slide up as I continue with my remarks, because what I hope you will be able to pick up upon is how the various aspects of our corporate social responsibility agenda are weaving into the entire strategy. They're not just part of the foundation and our, our highest pinnacle of our strategy, our mission, but they also weave in to our five strategic drivers that we believe are what going to allow us to be successful in owning that dynamic organization space that we choose to serve. So let me... Um, move to the next section of my remarks by uh, quoting one of my former countrymen, uh, Sir Winston Churchill. You always have a Brit speaking, you've always got to have a Churchill quote, right? Um, Churchill said, we make a living based on what we get, but we make a life based on what we give. We make a living based on what we get, but we make a life based on what we give. Uh, and at Grant Thornton, we really believe that. And that's why we've really uh, embedded this into our strategy. And that is how we plan to make a living and make a life, a life unique to our firm, but also a life for each of our people. Because ultimately, this has to resonate with each of our people. So how does this approach enhance business performance? Because I've made this point about it has to be synonymous with, with growth and with profitability. And the second question I suspect you're asking is, how do you go about starting to execute on this? So I'm now going to talk about how this links to growth and profitability. 
and where you start as it relates to execution, or at least where we've started, and you can uh, judge for yourselves how successful you think we're being. And I'd be very interested in the reception afterwards to, to get your feedback uh, on uh, where you think we might be uh, on the right track, or perhaps we could be pursuing other avenues. I said this to our partners recently, uh, and it actually caused them to be a little bit shocked. I said, at Grant Thornton, I believe that our people do not come here to our firm to work. And I got a lot of strange looks from my partners when I said, our people don't come to Grant Thornton to work, and I don't believe they do. I believe our people come to Grant Thornton to be part of Grant Thornton because they want to contribute. Not to work, to contribute. They want to contribute to our strategy, to our vision, to our mission, and to our broader communities. You know, it's often cited, you hear this cliche all the time, that there's a war for talent. And a wise person told me very recently, actually, that the war for talent is over. Talent won. And so I think you can see where I'm starting to go with connecting our corporate social responsibility agenda and how that interweaves with our ability to grow and have a profitable firm. Because you see, although I'm very proud, we're certainly not complacent, but we are very proud of our reputation at Grant Thornton for being a top global accounting firm uh, with a culture of respect, ethical behavior, and a really strong focus on quality. These qualities obviously are, are critical and important in attracting talent, but frankly alone, they are simply not enough. They are certainly not enough today. We have to attract good people because good people look today at their careers as an extension of their lives. And most importantly, great people, talented people, want an opportunity to make an individual difference in our world every day. They want a chance to contribute. So we at Grant Thornton aspire to give them that opportunity and to deliver to them that experience. We have built into our firm-wide mantra a phrase that we have adopted across the world, and that is, every day I make a difference. At Grant Thornton, you're given the opportunity every day to make a difference as an individual and collectively with your colleagues. People, as I said, want to come to work to contribute. They want to be with like-minded individuals, take pride in delivering to the organization on the organization's vision and objectives. And that's nice, and it's great, but we are still a business, and we do still have to grow and make money. Let me go back to Miss Nui. And I made the comment earlier about the progress that the Refresh project at Pepsi has made in advancing their brand, but perhaps they've certainly come under some criticism that it hasn't been impacting their bottom line. I had the opportunity uh, to attend a, a wonderful dinner in Chicago recently by the Economic Club of Chicago where Ms. Nui was actually the featured speaker. And she was, I have to say, incredibly inspirational. And she clearly has a passion around this whole subject of balancing long-term thinking with the constant pressure for short-term profitability. And she talked at length about a concept at Pepsi called performance with purpose. Now, this is a company-wide initiative that emphasizes delivering sustainable growth by investing in the healthier future for people and our planet. And actually, this is the umbrella uh, project for the, for the Refresh initiative. And the audience was really very moved by her commitment. And, and it was clear when she had completed our rem her remarks that she had captured the, the hearts and minds of the audience about this notion of being able to link profitability uh, with uh, the opportunity to build corporate responsibility into your agenda. So let me bring it back to Grant Thornton. 
It's nice to talk about Pepsi, and it's certainly nice to be inspired by Miss Nui, but what's it doing for our bottom line? Well, I've talked about our business vision, our business vision to be the leading firm serving dynamic organizations, and we believe if we're going to achieve that, we have to have dynamic people. We have to attract those dynamic people, that talent that I mentioned earlier that want to contribute. The linkage here is that those dynamic individuals, if we can attract them to our organization and offer them that experience to make a difference, to contribute, they will in turn provide a very distinctive client experience to all of the organizations that we work with. And by providing, as you can see, distinctive client service is a key part of our strategy. By providing a truly distinctive client experience, we will drive additional growth and profitability in our business, and we will enhance our brand. So hopefully now you're starting to see some of these linkages. We want to own the dynamic organization space. We have to drive a talent agenda that's going to attract and, and give an experience to people that want to contribute, dynamic individuals that want to make a difference. That's going to allow us to provide a distinctive client service, something different than our competitors are able to do in the experience that those dynamic people provide to our clients. And in doing so, we'll elevate our brand, we'll have the opportunity to drive increased revenue and improve our operations and profitability. It is what I like to refer to, and I, I, I say to my partners, truly a virtuous circle. It's a value proposition that we offer uh, our people, and it allows us to provide this distinctive client service to dynamic organizations while simultaneously having a positive impact in our communities, which again in turn attracts more dynamic people who want to share in that experience and that ambition. So I hope you're starting to see how these pieces come together and how this virtuous circle, if you like, starts to answer the question why it makes sense for our business. It feeds the pipeline of best and brightest talent who are really going to impact our clients through our profession and through our communities. A differentiated client experience leads to more valuable brand, revenue growth, increased profitability, and then the opportunity to reinvest in our people and invest in our communities. So now I'd like to move, if I can, to the execution phase. Hopefully, uh, I have been able to explain to you how we've embedded our commitment to social responsibility into our strategy, not just here in the US, but globally. And hopefully, I've started to make the linkages for you as to why, for us, that drives business opportunity, why it links to revenue growth and profitability. But what are we actually doing at Grant Thornton to execute? on that. And I want to walk you through uh, some examples of what we're doing in the four areas of where we intend and hope to make a difference to each other, uh, to our clients, to the profession, and to our communities. Now, interestingly, uh, you may have noticed that we title our strategy Unleashing Our Potential, because one of our fundamental beliefs is that by attracting people, giving them this experience, focusing on this mission and strategy, we can truly unleash the potential of individuals and collectively of the organization. So hopefully some of these examples will illustrate that sense of unleashing potential within the individuals within our firm and how that collectively unleashes the potential of our global organization. So let's take a look at, at an example of making a difference to colleagues. You, you may recall earlier last year, there was a, a terrible flood in Oklahoma. And following the personal devastation and massive flooding experienced by one of our senior managers, a, a gentleman called Chris, in our Oklahoma City office, his colleagues within our Oklahoma City practice banded together to help. Now, they didn't do this because they were asked to by the partner. Uh, 
they didn't do this because there was some corporate mandate or, or direction. They felt empowered and they chose to do this. They gathered together about 40 people and they showed up at Chris's house and they, they ripped out carpet, uh, they hauled out debris, they, they saved as much as they could save, they collected donations, they helped with reconstruction, they looked after family members, they brought necessities. They did all of this uh, without the direct involvement of Grant Thornton, although, of course, the firm did get involved to help them. But it was through their initiative, their empowerment, if you like, the unleashing of their potential, their commitment to make a difference to their colleagues, which drove them. And I got a very, very touching note from Chris's wife, Tiffany. And I'd like just to read a couple of sentences to you. T Tiffany wrote to me and said, when you see your baby's crib and bedroom walls lying in a pile in your front yard, mixed in with pictures and family keepsakes, it practically rips out your heart. I will never be able to thank all of you enough for what you did for our family. When I say to people, Grant Thornton truly has the best people in the world, I know whereof I speak. So this was one individual that was touched by the empowerment of our people that I'm so proud of that took it upon themselves to live our strategy of making a difference to our colleagues. Let me give you an example of making a difference to our dynamic clients. And I, I could have chosen a number of different examples here, uh, but I chose one that I hope will resonate, particularly given the subject matter of this evening's uh, discussion. And obviously, uh, our, our experience with our clients, as, as I've already alluded to, is at the heart of where we have the ability to grow our, a profitable firm. Uh, you know, we chose at Grant Thornton to pursue, as part of uh, one of our chosen markets, and you'll see that phrase here in our strategy, about wanting to be the leading firm serving dynamic organizations in our chosen markets, not every market. One of our chosen markets is the not-for-profit industry sector. And we provide services to not-for-profit organizations up and down the countries, in, including uh, foundations, associations, uh, higher education institutions, uh, and, and, and larger sophisticated charities. In fact, we have the second largest uh, not-for-profit practice in the United States. And in New York and Chicago, uh, there are two cities where we actually have the largest not-for-profit practice of any public accounting firm. And a great example, if you like, of our strategy of wanting to gain leadership in a chosen market. But a focus on not-for-profit organizations is particularly significant because it really does reinforce our commitment, as I said, not only to be the best at what we choose to do, but also to live our broader strategy. And this became very apparent during the recent uh, economic downturn, uh, where obviously not-for-profit organizations across the country were struggling with fewer dollars coming in in donations, difficulty with maintaining their financial credibility, and in fact, some of them simply struggling with survival. And, and we uh, had a number of our professionals that worked extensively to help and support them during that time, uh, often uh, as part of our ability to uh, bill for those services, uh, but at times as part of our community commitment. OK, what about the profession, making a difference to the profession? You know, making a difference to the profession and to the public interest, uh, investors, the financial markets, the global economy, as I've already stated, is a, is a fundamental part of what we do as a public accounting organization. And we believe that during certainly a crisis period for our profession, after the collapse of a major accounting firm in, in 2002, we were willing to take a leading voice, a bold voice, if you like, in helping to reestablish the credibility of our profession. And we took some very uh, significant stands on some, some sensitive and touchy issues at the time. We actually announced a five-point plan for restoring 
confidence and trust in the profession and the capital markets. And we, we uh, had some very uh, controversial statements at times around certain accounting standards, like accounting for stock options. Uh, and, and another example would be we were the first firm, the first global firm, to say that we were not going to perform the documentation of internal controls and the testing of controls under Sarbanes-Oxley for our financial accounting audit clients. And some of these stands did not always uh, align with the views of others in the profession, and frankly, not always with our clients. Uh, and of course, that led sometimes to some stressful conversations. But I feel very confident in saying that we never lost a client because of an ethical stand or our belief on one of these issues or our desire to want to make a difference to the profession. Clients may not always have liked what we had to say, but they did always respect us for saying it. Now that's at the firm-wide level, and that's taking some bold stands to commit to making a difference to the profession as a whole. But as I'd mentioned, making a difference is not just about the organizational level, it's about the individual level. And we encourage and we empower and we ask our individuals to again unleash their potential by taking part in developing the profession. I'm proud that we have a former graduate from uh, DU's graduate tax master's in law program, uh, a partner in the firm, Jeffrey Frischman, uh, and he is head of our uh, tax practice quality group. He's spoken here on a number of occasions. Uh, and I know that uh, he's engaged very much in the annual uh, Federal Tax Institute. But we do this beyond the partner level. Uh, I think uh, I had the opportunity to chat with Tiffany today, who's in the audience. Uh, Tiffany's one of our senior managers in Denver. Uh, she'll be uh, teaching here starting in a, in a few weeks. Uh, we have a senior manager in Ch Chicago who's currently on a year appointment with the SEC. Uh, as a professional fellow uh, with a tremendous opportunity to make a difference. And we encourage our people to teach and to participate in professional associations up and down the country, not only with the broader AICPA, but also with uh, Asian and Hispanic and African American professional organizations. And I'm, I'm always interested when I get notes and letters uh, from our people that are participating in making a difference to a profession in that manner. Okay, the fourth area of making a difference, often where most people gravitate to when they think about embodying a corporate social responsibility agenda, and that's making a difference to our communities. And I'll start, but I'm not going to just exclude my remarks to this, but I will start with talking about the environmental front. Certainly as a firm, we've worked hard to get greener. And we actually have an initiative that we call Experience Green. And we're certainly aiming to take this to new levels. It's, again, very much at the beginning within our firm. And as part of that, during 2011, for the first time, I'm proud to say, we're actually going to measure the carbon footprint of our firm. But as part of our Experience Green initiative, we've adopted uh, formal environmental policies we did this in conjunction, actually, with uh, Earth Day in 2008. And we have offices now that are following uh, greener practices, simple things like turning off lights in unused rooms, installing more eco-friendly and cost-saving screen savers, uh, and lighting within our offices, uh, getting rid of the dreaded styrofoam cups and plastic eating utensils. Uh, at the national level, we're selecting vendors because of their green credentials. And we're actually uh, working it for all of our major meetings to design them to offset and cancel the carbon footprint created by those meetings. Uh, very exciting development. Our new Atlanta offices, office rather, just opened uh, a LEED certified office building. Uh, and this office is 29% larger, but uses 30% less energy than their previous office building. And green is becoming increasingly important to our clients. And here again, I'd like to make the connection between 
good for a corporate social responsibility and good for business. We are getting asked increasingly by our clients as we put proposals together to give them details of our environmental footprint and our participation in protecting the environment. I'm going to just pause here a moment because we have a very brief video that talks about our Experience Green initiative, and I think you'd be interested in seeing it because it, it gives you a portrayal of what we're doing in this area of making a difference to our communities. If you wouldn't mind running the video, please. Experience Green is all about corporate responsibility. Uh, Stephen has coined the phrase, the best firm in the world and the best firm for the world. Experience Green is one of those building blocks. A perfect example of how being good environmental stewards has saved the firm some money it comes in the, in the form of paper usage. While we have a long way to go, it may surprise some people to know that per full-time equivalent, we were using two and a half trees a year, and we've gotten that down to one and a half trees a year. But in addition, we've started to educate people, and we call it take-it-home education, about being good environmental stewards in the office place, but it also translates into their home life as well. So whether it's recycling, or you know, using paper, or turning off the lights, or um, water usage, and so and so forth, it, it kind of helps because you're in the office so much already, you kind of develop those habits there and, and you can bring them home with you too. The Atlanta office is a wonderful example of tremendous environmental stewardship. It all started when we had the opportunity to design our new office space. At the outset, we were very keen to qualify as a LEED certified space. In order to get the gold LEED certification, there were several different things that the firm decided to focus on. One of the big things, first of all, of course, was to really concentrate on the design of the space, the use of the space, the use of recycled materials, the use of materials that come from within a 500 mile radius of Atlanta. Our plumbing system, our lighting system, our carpeting, our furniture, our workstations, everything had in mind the point system that is laid out in the LEED certification process. Ten years ago, I know no one really cared if your space was environmentally friendly or LEED certified, but we're finding that it is more and more important to people and companies, and companies are having to report on what they do to be environmentally friendly. What's going on in the marketplace today is that transformational companies are transforming the green landscape. There's just no doubt about it. They are greening up their supply chain. We're getting specific questions that are being asked to us uh, on MSAs and RFPs about what have we done to reduce our carbon footprint and what do we plan to do and what is our environmental policies and procedures and how are we executing. We have in front of us a huge revenue opportunity to build consulting services, a test services and tax services around sustainability, carbon management, carbon measurement. If we don't walk the talk and look into the mirror and say, we too need to be sustainable, I think it's a hollow promise when we make these commitments to our clients. And this initiative is very important and provides a huge competitive advantage in recruiting our new recruits. And it's nice that they can come into our office and see the things that, that we do uh, and that, we, that we're committed to continue doing. If we're not part of this movement, we are going to be at a competitive disadvantage. This is not simply being the best firm for the world. This is a business imperative. The Experience Green Initiative is a wonderful opportunity for anyone at the partner level, at an ICS level, at the senior manager level, everyone to get involved and make a difference in how the local office is run and how the local office is branded in the community. Thank you. Hopefully that's a good illustration of, again, how we're weaving this into our strategy, but also how this makes good business sense for Grant Thornton. 
Okay, I'm conscious of the time, and I'm, I'm moving towards the end of my remarks. I know we, we, we certainly want to have time for, for questions. I do want to touch, though, on a, on a couple more elements of this making a difference to our broader communities, because it's not just our communities in the United States. Uh, we take a very uh, strong global perspective, and as I mentioned, uh, we join hands uh, with 30,000 employees in over 100 countries around the world as part of the Grant Thornton organization. And, and so we really embrace uh, our global responsibilities and humanitarian concerns that go along with that. And we've made some very specific difference, I believe, in the last year or 18 months. Uh, we've been involved and we've contributed certainly to the terrible uh, tragedies that we've seen in, in Haiti, flood victims in Pakistan. Uh, we're engaged in a particular organization helping orphan children in China, uh, typhoon victims in the Philippines, and, and, and many others. And what's important here, though, and I really want to emphasize this, this is not just about financial contribution, which of course is important. It's not just about giving. It really is about actions, and I, and I want to touch on one example here of one of our senior associates in New York who participates in a, in a Habitat program, and she's traveled to Brazil, she's traveled to other countries, and, and this year she was in Africa, and she emailed me from Africa. And part of the reason I'm telling the story is because of the emphasis I want to put on. It's not just about financial giving, it's about action and it's about volunteerism, but it's also that we have a senior associate in Africa that took the time to email me because she personally felt the linkage between what she was doing and what we were trying to do as an organization. And she said, my hands might be small, but they can help make this world a better place one brick at a time. I leave for Mo Mozambique next and I can't wait. You can imagine how that makes me feel when I receive that. And we get involved uh, not only at the local, uh, sorry, the global level with our volunteerism, but at the local level. I was really interested in hearing Jim, our managing partner here in Denver, talking in our reception about the time that we give, was it four days a year, Jim, to our people here, paid time a year here in Denver, uh, to uh, give that time back to the local community. Uh, that's not sanctioned by the national office. That wasn't a mandate that came down from me to Jim in Denver. That's what the partners and people in Denver chose to do as they interpreted their delivery of our strategy, and I absolutely applaud it. Last area on this whole making a difference to our communities and how we weave it into our business agenda that I want to touch on is our training programs, because we've done some very specific things to weave our, our desire to make a difference into our training programs. We have uh, training for new managers and new senior managers. And the last several years during this training, we have incorporated the opportunity to build bicycles as part of a team building exercise that we then contribute back to the local community. And we work with local community leaders to uh, determine where there are socioeconomic needs and those bikes can really have an impact on children's lives. Now, you'll be pleased to know that after our managers and senior managers have got through with constructing these bikes, we have professionals <laughs> come along and make sure that they have, in fact, been constructed appropriately. But if I could, I, I participated in this myself, and if I could share with you the excitement and the enthusiasm and, and what that generates in our people. And then, and then this last year, we actually brought the children in for a lunch where we, each group that made a bike, presented their bike to the child, and we had, we had lunch with the children, um, not only in terms of what it does to give back to our communities, but what it does for our ability to attract and retain and create that culture and environment for those dynamic people who, remember, they're the people that are going to provide that distinctive client service to our dynamic clients. And, and we actually built it into our partner meeting this year in Phoenix uh, when we had a large group of partners, almost 100 partners, participate in an event uh, where we put uh, backpacks together with food and supplies uh, for school children from, a, from an underprivileged part of Phoenix, uh, the Palomino Elementary School. And I'll just briefly quote uh, one of the letters that I received from the principal 
She said, you and your partners touched the lives of our children more than you will ever know. The experience you offered our students will be a day they will remember throughout their lives. Perhaps some will even become doctors as a result. I have to say that as much as we may have given those children, I think we as partners in the firm got a lot more back from them. So let me close, because I do want to get to the Q&A. And I think we have a nice picture that we can put up that sort of captures a lot of what I'm saying. I don't know if you can read the back of that T-shirt, but it says, every day I make a difference. And this was during our uh, participation in Chicago at the sponsored walk for the Breast Cancer Network of Strength this year. So yes, corporate responsibility, corporate social responsibility is about the individual as well as about how the individual multiplies his or her impact by joining hands with the organization's endeavors. And these endeavors and goals must be based on strategy through which making money and the world a better place are synonymous. Last year, we invited people from all over the firm to tell us how they thought they made a difference. And I want to share with you what one person wrote. This young lady wrote, I make a difference every day because I work here. Grant Thornton collaborates to mirror the real world. We work for many governmental agencies serving the public interest, as well as some of the country's economic backbone companies who need assistance during this difficult period. We're putting together the finances for one of the provinces in Iraq. Everyone who works here is part of a firm which is serving the public good at a time when our country is at war and our economy is in crisis. This was written, as I said, about 12 months ago. So that's our corporate social responsibility agenda speaking to me and hope, hopefully rather, it's now speaking to you. So we have a long way to go. I recognize that. We have a lot to learn, a lot to learn from others, a lot to learn from you in this room, from this institution, uh, from Daniels, from uh, certainly the, the DU, the Do Something campaign, which I think is a, is a fantastic idea, from the PepsiCo's, from the Whole Foods, from the Coors, and no doubt from the Starbucks, as you'll, as you'll hear in one of your next presentations. But as a, as a business person and a CEO, I would like to use our firm's young voice of experience to rally others to this conviction that building revenues and profitability and assuming corporate social responsibility are part of one engine for growth. Growth of revenues, growth of reputation, and growth of shared responsibility as a unified human community. As just one individual, I leave you with my sincere and unwavering belief that we can always make the world better and that we can always solve problems faster and better if we do it together. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I understand we do have some time for questions, and I would be delighted to um, encourage you to ask questions. And we, we don't have a microphone runner, but I, will, I think the acoustics in this wonderful hall are, are so fabulous, we don't need one. But I'll also be glad to repeat the question if people are having difficulty hearing. So Chris, you said you were going to ask a question, so I'm glad you're living up to your promise. Um, have you built a team, a support team, to help you uh, with some of the innovative ideas in this space? And, and, and perhaps how are you building this liaison with great universities such as DU to have uh, leading edge uh, best practices in this space? Yes. Uh, the short answer to the question is not yet. But it is absolutely the next stage of our development in this process. We, we are relying at the moment, uh, frankly, too heavily uh, on the, uh, this, this process of empowerment and decentralization. And we absolutely do not want to limit that 
or, or in any way prevent that. In fact, we want to encourage it. But we recognize that, that the next stage in our development here is to create a little more infrastructure around what we can do as a firm to support this agenda, learn from best practices, engage with other organizations, and frankly bring a little more coordination to what we're doing. Because the upside of, of empowerment and decentralization is you, you get what I described here in Denver. The downside is we, we can reinvent the wheel. We don't always get as much uh, out of a particular uh, project or initiative for our people as, as we could. Uh, now, at the same time, you know, we don't want to build a huge administrative infrastructure. The last thing we want to create is bureaucracy around this, um, or red tape, or barriers for people to feel empowered to live this strategy. So one of the reasons we haven't jumped into that, and we're being a little cautious, is we, we, we know we need it, but we're anxious to make sure we don't create something that actually then has the reverse effect which dampens the enthusiasm of this unleashing of potential and empowerment that we're trying to encourage within the organization. So I think actually this, this is a really important question for us. And the way we handle it and the way we are able to engage with that challenge will have a big impact on how quickly we're able to move this forward. The other aspect of this is too, we would love to do it globally. Um, we, we try to look at everything through that lens of before we embark on something here in the United States, what can we do collectively with our, with our global colleagues? Um, for obvious reasons, it's, it's, it's more powerful. We get the uh, ability to leverage talent and financial resources around the world. And frankly, our, our people uh, really respond to being part of a global effort, not just a local effort. So it's a great question. In a year, hopefully, I can give you a, a, some examples of our experience and how we've moved that forward. We have lots of volunteers, by the way. What's very interesting, we have lots of people coming forward saying, I would like to be part of this. I would like to spend more of my time on this. I had a, a very talented uh, director in our business step forward and, and, and say, they would, could they lead this for us? So we have no shortage of people that are enthusiastic about wanting to be part of this agenda. Great question, thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir, at the back. Uh, congratulations on the great start. It looks like that you're off to with your program. I have uh, two thank questions, you. one hopefully you can answer, uh, and that is around what do you budget or what would you think you should budget for a company your size for your financial contributions or philanthropic contributions? And the second question I have is what framework do you use to measure your results? Yes. Um, I, I will frame my response to your first question by indicating that we are, we are very keen, and I'm, I'm not sure this came out completely in my remarks, but we're very keen to push this notion that corporate social responsibility is, is much less about uh, how you give your money away and much more about how you make your money. And I think that's a really important notion because what we see... Uh, someone in the reception was asking me about um, what we see in our client base um, that are not necessarily big global multinationals. Um, um, what we often see are philanthropic programs sort of labeled as corporate social responsibility. And not for one moment would I want to, to stop those organizations from pursuing those philanthropic pursuits. Uh, but we believe that's only one, one part of our... Uh, approach to corporate responsibility. We, we don't actually budget this. We don't actually, you might say this is sort of irresponsible of us to do this. Some of my partners may say that. But we don't actually roll this all up to look at it at a, at a firm-wide basis. We, we allow the offices and business units to make certain commitments that align with their ability to deliver on their business plans and meet their operational expectations, and also be able to meet their philanthropic commitments. And then we do set aside some funding at the national level, which if you don't mind, I'd prefer not to, to share with you. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a meaningful amount then, where we will do some things on a national basis, like our, our commitment to Breast Cancer Network of Strength was a national commitment. 
uh, we have made a national commitment to the 9-11 Memorial and Museum Project in New York because we felt that the, a lot of what was trying to be accomplished with that memorial and museum in, in, embodied a lot of what we felt about making a difference in the world and giving people, individuals, the freedom and empowerment and opportunity to do that. Um, so that's probably not a particularly satisfactory to answer to your question, but it does sort of link to this idea of you, you've still got to make money and you've got to have a return in order to provide a return to your investors, in our case, our partners and our st other stakeholders, and also be able to reinvest uh, that return back into the business and, and into our people and into our communities. I do not think, now going to the second part of your question, that we have figured out yet how to really measure this. I think we measure it anecdotally. We, we measure it through some of the feedback that I described to you today. Uh, you know, certainly, I mean, we're fortunate our, our business is growing and we are profitable. So, but you know, can you make a correlation directly between our efforts in this area and, and, uh, and that? I think, you know, would obviously you would argue there are a lot of other things that impact that. I think as we move forward where we will be able to measure it most effectively is in the attraction and retention of people. Because we do know there is a direct correlation between our growth and profitability and our ability to attract and retain the very best talent. And I think as we start to see the impact of this on our ability to attract talent from competitors, uh, retain and develop that talent, uh, we will clearly see that impact our bottom line. And I, I, I think that we will be able to draw some very close correlations between these efforts and that focus on our, that, that element of our focus on our people. Um, but that is a very, um, uh, I would say, emerging area. Clearly you saw in the, in the Experience Green Initiative where there are some areas which you can latch onto, like how many uh, trees per person are we using in paper or, or what's our carbon footprint. Um, those types of things are, are actually more measurable and where we can measure it, we are trying to uh, measure impact. But we are, we are very much feeling our way through that. We do not have all the answers. It's a great question. Yes, sir. Outside of your professional career, what would you say the most important difference you've made is as an individual? <laughs> Gosh. Well, You know, one of the things we talked about today is, is actually the merging of your personal life and professional life. And rather than pick on something that is specific to my personal life, though I'm frankly you know, not, not shy to, 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 to share that with you, I think, as I reflect on your question, the most significant difference that I can make is making this work. Because not that this is simply my idea or my strategy. This belongs to all of Grant Thornton. This belongs to our, our, our people around the world. But I ultimately, obviously, have the responsibility to make this come alive and make this happen. And so if I am able, through my own personal efforts and leadership, to be able to instill this in our organization, allow this to really become a reality, and give all the people, all those 30,000 people around the world in Grant Thornton the opportunity to make a difference and have an impact, then I can't think of anything else that I could do that would be of greater um, you know, personal uh, contribution to, to making a difference uh, in, in our world. And I hope you don't think that's dodging your question. It's not meant to, but I, I really do believe that. Thank you for asking. Yes. I, I do, do see big cultural, cultural differences. First of all, I will say that um, the United States is one of, if not the most philanthropic societies that I've certainly lived in, certainly participated in. Uh, it, 
much more so than, than in Europe. I mean, the numbers bear it out too. If you look at what uh, Americans give back to their communities, you know, their, their churches, charitable organizations, both in time and money. Um, so from a philanthropic perspective, it's much more, uh, I, would, I would say, wired into the DNA of the United States. But then again, in Europe, the Europeans were much further ahead of us, I think, in terms of looking at impact of climate change, uh, impact on the environment, uh, some broader humanitarian issues that we didn't always focus on quite so closely in the United States. So that would be a, a contrast. And then in Asia, you know, in, in, and again, I, I, I'm always cautious when I talk about Asia because it's so different, obviously, from country to country. And, you know, Japan and China couldn't be more different in terms of cultures. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll run the risk of making a broad generalization here. Uh, you, Asia very much has a charity begins at home type of concept. It's all about, first and foremost, your family, your extended family, educating your children, looking after the broader family, and a huge commitment to that and a huge financial and personal commitment to that. And, and given the emerging nature of the economies in many parts of Asia and the limited resources that people have and the hours that they work, whether it be in, you know, in a subsistence agricultural environment or in you know, a more modern factory environment, the, the, the biggest part of their contribution to giving back is to their extended family, as I saw it. And I just don't think the maturity is there yet in many of those societies, and certainly not the financial um, uh, uh, maturity and, and ability to be able to look significantly more broader than that. So those would be just off the top of my head, some of the difference. So the short answer is yes, and you know, to broadly look at North America, Asia, and, and Europe, those would be just some very quick observations. But one thing that does, you know, as we talk about our 30,000 people around the world, one thing that does absolutely unite people is this, especially younger people around the world, is this notion of whether, no matter how it manifests itself, is people do at their heart want to make a difference. And they do want to see a better, a better world and a better place for the, their families and the people that, that are around them and, and their colleagues across the oceans. And that, that does, certainly within our organization, bind us together. I'm looking at my watch keepers at the back. Do we have time for one more, or do you think, well, just one more? OK. If we have one, I'd be glad to take one. Yes, sir. So I quite want to Uh, we certainly, to the point that was made in the video and the point I made, increasingly clients are, or, or potential clients are asking us to talk about our uh, commitment to the environment, for example. Um, although there are still many, many proposals and many situations where we're not asked. I have not had any feedback from the marketplace or for clients or for prospects that have said, you know, we, we think you shouldn't be spending your time and money on this. I think when they become aware of it, uh, they're proud to be associated with a firm that has this kind of commitment. It doesn't excuse you from your ability to deliver on professional excellence, of course. It's never going to get you off the hook. No, no client is going to say, you missed our audit deadline, you messed up our tax return, but we really loved your green initiative, so you know, we're going to let you off the hook. And I know that's not what you're asking. But, but assuming that we are meeting and exceeding their, their professional requirements, I think the vast majority, when they become aware of it, even if they're not asking about it, really feel good about being associated. And actually, uh, many will ask us how they can join us or work with us on some of these things that our, that our people are doing. And some of our best examples, actually, I perhaps should have picked on some today, is where our people have got together with people that clients. And obviously, we have to be careful with independence issues and things like that. But there are things we can do with clients. And those are very powerful, very powerful. And I think we're going to see a lot, lot more of that. Well, thank you for your questions. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening. So, Stephen, I have to admit that you worried me with your not-so-hot personality story. 
So as I was sitting there and you were talking, I pulled out my Blackberry and I looked up in the Webster's Dictionary and found the perfect term for you. And so that you don't have to go back and look it up, <laughs> here's what the dictionary said about you. Funny, knowledgeable, global, forward thinking, a steward, caring, ethical, and someone who is truly leading the way and making a difference in this world. Thank you for sharing the inspiring story of Grant Thornton with us and with our audience. Let's give him another round oh, of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, don't go back and check the dictionary when you get back to <laughs> Chicago. That's really what it says. Please join us in the lobby to um, have a reception with Stephen and certainly with other members of the Grant Thornton firm. And we look forward to seeing you at our next speaker event in March. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This is very, very. Thank you.